Why is a deep sea bacterium like a research submersible? Don't worry, it's not a riddle. Anything in the deep sea, whether that's the microbes that live down there or the research vehicles sent down to take samples of them, face the same challenges from being way down deep. So why study the deep ocean depths and how do we do it? I'm Sarah Castor-Perry and for this Naked Scientist special, I went to Scripps Institution of Oceanography to find out more from Professor of Marine Microbial Genetics, Professor Douglas Bartlett and engineer extraordinaire Kevin Hardy. Here's Professor Bartlett. There's so much diversity of, of microbial life in the ocean in general and especially in the deep sea and we just don't know a lot of what's there. So there's all this biology that's just waiting to be explored. And so we're, we've been taken up with that. I have been uh, told of this quote that came out of the Census for Marine Microbial Life that there's the equivalent of, I think it's something like 35 full-grown African elephants worth of microbes for every man, woman, and child on, on the planet. And most of those microbes in the ocean are in the, in the deep ocean, maybe not in extreme deep ocean environments, but, but found at depth. And so there's a lot of diversity of life down there. We're interested in the adaptations of microbial life to deep ocean settings because they're so different. They're dark. Uh, the way microbes get nutrients in the deep ocean is very different from that in surface waters. They're adapted to low temperatures as a rule and they're adapted to high hydrostatic pressure. And it's this last parameter, high pressure, that we've really been focusing on. And it would be wonderful to be able to get those organisms into culture to more easily do biochemistry and genetics. It'd also be useful to, to look at their genomes and do culture-independent molecular analyses and to look at processes like CO2 fixation and other biogeochemical cycles. And you mentioned um, about how they get their food and their energy is very different to organisms on the surface. So I suppose for most sort of light dwelling food chains, I guess photosynthesis is the start of all energy chains. But how does it start down in the deep sea? Also with photosynthesis for the most part. So uh, photosynthesis in surface waters gives rise to blooms of photosynthetic microorganisms and they eventually die, they aggregate, and they fall down through the water column. They decompose during their descent, but some of the remains make it to the, the deepest seafloor environments. And so that particulate organic carbon drives much of the productivity in the deep ocean. But because it's consumed on the way down, it's altered. It's highly recalcitrant types of organic material that many of these organisms are living on. So that's the, the dominant source of organic carbon and food for deep ocean microbes. But another important source is dark CO2 fixation. So just as CO2 fixation occurs during photosynthesis, other energetic processes can enable CO2 fixation in the dark. And some of those processes exist in very deep ocean uh, condition, environments, and we don't know a lot about rates of carbon fixation at depth, but that clearly is important too. And so that's things like chemosynthesis that we see perhaps in microbes at deep sea vents and things as opposed to photosynthesis. Right, that, that's exactly right. So CO2 fixation is known to occur in hydrothermal vents and there are five different pathways that may come into play. Um, and it hasn't been nearly so studied in the, the less obviously dramatic deep ocean environments outside of the vent with their charismatic megafauna. So if you look at something like a bacterium or an, a microorganism, something that's very small, do they face different challenges from the high pressure than something like a larger bodied animal? The general problems that a microbe would face would be very similar to the cells of, of any organism, an invertebrate or a vertebrate. It all has to do with high pressure influences on volume changes of equilibria and of activation. So biochemical processes are very different under high pressure and all organisms are going to face that issue. And so how do they get around these issues? What, what adaptations have they come up with that help them solve it? The most well-studied adaptation has to do with membrane lipids. The membrane lipids of deep ocean organisms, fish to bacteria, are loaded with highly unsaturated fatty acids. And that's critical to keeping the membrane in the right physical state, a semi-liquid state, so that it can function for transport and for energetics and for other processes. 
So how exactly do you go and retrieve samples of these things? Is that what you do? You go and then you bring them back and study them in the lab? Do you have a, I guess, you can't really necessarily study them in situ because you just kind of look at them and you think, I don't really know what's going on there. Yeah, it's hard to, to, to explore microbial activities and, and processes in situ, but that's a, a growing area of development in the ocean sciences that is coming up with more autonomous instruments that allow you to go where you need to go and to measure those, those parameters that you'd like to measure. But what we usually do is we work with an engineer here at, at Scripps who comes up with these wonderful untethered toys that can be deployed from relatively small ocean craft and sink all the way down to the deepest ocean depth and can be used to collect water samples and mud and um, to, to collect animals using beta traps and things like that. And after a prescribed time, we'll release their ballast, close the doors of whatever it is that they're sampling, seawater or animals like crustaceans, and come back up to the surface. And we get those samples at the surface, and then we process them. We try and culture some of the diversity that's out there using a variety of different energy sources and culture conditions, but always in pressurizable titanium or stainless steel containers. And so that's what's really peculiar about the kind of microbiology we do. We have all these cold rooms stuffed to the gills with pressure vessels that are pumped up to as much as 16,000 pounds per square inch of pressure to see what we can grow. And so we couple that with different energy sources and electron acceptors and various physiological kinds of enrichment conditions to see what we can get. And so far it's been it's been valuable. We've been getting new kinds of microbes, in some cases not just new species or, or, or genera of microbes, but even new subphyla and phyla of microbes coming up that hadn't been cultured previously from deep ocean environments. And so that's a wonderful resource that keeps on giving because you can culture these organisms, you can get as much biomass as you need, you can do studies of lipids and proteins and DNA replication and all sorts of different processes. One can look at secondary metabolites that might have some useful uh, applications in biotechnology and biomedicine. And so we really love to go after the cultures, but you can also with the samples that we get, get DNA to look at the the breadth of, of life that we've harvested and, and get a better handle on the diversity and um, the likely physiological processes. We can look at gene expression. We can look at the proteins that are being made in, in C2 in some cases. Um, maybe we can do some small molecule isolations. All of that kind of information gives us a much better handle on the characteristics of life and the adaptations of life and uh, the, the, the more globally relevant processes like CO2 sequestration that may be going on. And speaking of globally relevant processes, how, how do these deep sea microbes fit into the ecosystem of the wider oceans in general? Well, there's virtually nothing known about their contribution to the trophic dynamics, but they must be important. So uh, undoubtedly, those microbes that are living either off of the particular organic carbon that rains down or, or fixing CO2 themselves and, and going through various sorts of lifestyles to, to grow and reproduce, undoubtedly they're food for other organisms and are contributing to the diversity of, of uh, grazing protozoa and uh, and other organisms up the food chain, eventually leading to the the invertebrates that are found in in the benthic environment, and perhaps the vertebrates as, as well that are up in the water column. So, what do you see as the most exciting things that are coming out of looking at the deep sea? Is it the kind of the excitement of finding so much new diversity, or of the ecological roles, or the discovery of new chemicals, that sort of thing? Gosh, all of the above. Um, I think people just see it as this environment that has been grossly understudied. We seem to, to study deep ocean environments for various purposes in, in spurts. And a year or so ago, there was the 50th anniversary of the Trieste um, voyage to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. And I think that rekindled interest in, in many people's minds of going and exploring 
uh, so much of our planet that is yet to be discovered in our inner space, in our in our deep ocean environments. And there are all these questions that exist. We we know that there are deep ocean mud volcanoes and cold seeps and microbial mats and various kinds of reducing environments with their own types of microbes and and invertebrates and other organisms. But we we don't know very much about what's out there in a lot of the ocean environment, especially the deep ocean environment that's been the most inaccessible part of it all. So the promise is there, and I have no doubt that we'll learn new rules about how nutrients are recycled and how carbon can be sequestered and the influence of the deep ocean environment on on the atmosphere and on climate. So I think I think there's just going to be so many discoveries about fundamental aspects of life in very different environments that seem more like uh, moon of Jupiter than part of our our own world, but we just have to get out there and explore. And finally, I spotted earlier that little tiny polystyrene cup on your windowsill. Is that something that was taken down in one of these little unmanned subs? What a great question. Um, you know, I don't even remember where this came from. Uh, it either came from one of those small untethered instruments, or it looks like in the, in this case it came from a, a dive with the Alvin submersible. I see. And so that probably went down just a couple kilometers in depth. But some of these instruments that we deploy have been used at depths uh, as great as nine kilometers or so. So, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm guessing it was once a sort of normal-sized polystyrene cup, and it's now sort of the size of a very small egg cup. It's an illustration of the pressures that we're looking at, I suppose. It, it is, it is. Uh, this is a perfect example of how high pressure promotes volume decreases, and it does that to a styrofoam cup. But at high pressure, the, the styrofoam cups get compressed to something like ceramic and greatly decreased in size. So I suppose that is a great illustration of the problems that microbes like that face in the deep sea. It is, and, and also for people who want to deploy instruments in the deep ocean, because everything has to be designed so that it can cope with high pressure. So pressure housings are necessary for, for every component of equipment that gets deployed down deep. And whether it's a, a manned submersible or an autonomous instrument or some cabled array, it all has to be pressure resistant. Well, speaking of taking stuff down to the deep ocean and how exactly we go about looking at all the, the microbes and all the life down there, we're now joined by Kevin Hardy. Kevin, hello. Hi. So I, th I hear that you have quite a lot of exciting gadgets and instruments that you might be able to show us. We have some of the tools of science that get us down to the deepest ocean depths, so just across the hall. Let's go, let's go. Wow, this is quite an exciting room full of gadgets and big yellow spheres. What, what exactly am I looking at here? Uh, this here is actually uh, one of our deep ocean vehicles. It's a small 17-inch outside diameter glass sphere with an acoustic transponder up on top so we can acoustically communicate with it at depth and uh, gives us about 54 pounds of buoyancy as well as command control. So that gives us a, a, a payload capability, which means we can haul stuff down to the deep ocean. Um, and then haul stuff back up, I guess. And then haul yeah. stuff back up, yeah. It should be a round trip. So we have uh, one of our frames right here. We actually try to use uh, fiberglass uh, reinforced plastic, FRP, because the water weight is so much lighter. And then we attach uh, plastic bottles onto here. So even though it looks large, underwater really weighs nothing. So we can carry uh, large volumes of water back the surface. Well, it's quite noisy in here, so should we, should we take a couple of your exciting gadgets back to the office and we can, we can have a look at them sure. in, in more depth, as it were. <laughs> oh, fantastic pun there. So we have a, a few things we do. Uh, each of the vehicles is a, is a composite of a variety of technologies, and we're experimenting with some new ideas. These are uh, lithium-ion batteries, which um, are actually really cool because they're, they're vacuum-packed, and you can see that there's really, um, it's sort of like those Ziploc bags that hold a jelly sandwich. Oh, yeah. So, that, I mean, that's pretty small. I mean, it's kind of, what, three or four inches long, about an inch wide. So, I mean, how much power does that sort of thing give out? Yes, this will give us uh, quite a bit, actually. Uh, it's almost 12 volts at about 2 amp hours. So you can really pack a lot of punch. But the other great thing about this, you can, you can... Um, package these in an oil environment so they're pressure compensated. And we've done that and run them down to pressures greater than the deepest ocean depths. 
So the advantage to us is we can put these outside and we never have to open up those glass spheres that you saw on board of a small ship. So it makes turnaround very easy. So we've, uh, we're have we excited about that because rather than bringing water up to be processed on the ship, we can bring our little factory with us down to the seafloor and leave it down there for a long period of time and actually get a lot more uh, of the microbes that we're looking for. So obviously pressure is something that these are calibrated for. Is pressure the major problem that we look at when we're going down to study the deep sea? Yeah, it's really the first order problem is because uh, that'll affect your, your, your buoyancy. So it's really a buoyancy game. It's like having a lift to the deep sea. So we can uh, we'll put a big anchor on these things, send them down, and uh, we have to design them to either tolerate pressure or to be stronger than the pressure. And once you're down there, it's actually pretty benign. It's, temperatures are fairly co constant. Uh, there's no light to deal with. Currents are pretty nominal. Corrosion is one of the problems we have to deal with, sort of a secondary problem. But, uh, you know, those things are easily engineered around. So we've got some experience doing this. So uh, some of the problems remain the same. The, uh, the core extraction problem is the one where we go down to get sediments from the seafloor. It's well known that it's like uh, trying to take a, um, a core sample out of peanut butter. You know, it really plunge in a core tube and you pull it out, and it really has a lot of adhesion. So one of the techniques that was first proposed in 1960 was a, uh, uh, by a guy named David Moore here in San Diego. And that was actually a, uh, a technique where you take a steel core tube and it's lined with a plastic sleeve. Oh, I see. So this is kind of, it's, yeah, it's, like a, it's almost like a drain pipe kind of size metal tube we've got here. And it's surrounded by this sort of rather sturdy looking load of plastic rings and things. So how exactly <laughs> does this work? Well, this is really great because what he decided to do was rather than uh, fight the seafloor, he was going to give it up. And what he did was he, he took this, this steel tube and it would go down to the seafloor, hit the bottom, and then the uh, mud would push up on this release and it would leave the steel tube behind. Oh. And it would actually draw out the plastic liner. And so you leave a steel casement in the bottom, which is actually um, rusts away in a short period of time and it's uh, fairly cheap. And so he just decided to, uh, rather than beat them, join them and give them the tube, and he extracted the sediment. That works out actually pretty well, especially for free vehicles where you only have a limited amount of buoyancy. So I guess it's one of the problems is it's not just being able to get the sample into your machine, it's being able to get the machine off the seafloor again, because I guess it's kind of like getting stuck in that goopy mud at the beach where you get your feet stuck and you can't get out and you're sort of making that sort of splatchy yep. noise, but you're obviously under so much pressure under the sea as well, so I guess it's kind of a bit of a problem. It is. Uh, some of the core samples that are done have a line that goes all the way back up to the ship with a big powerful winch. They can haul this thing with hundreds of pounds. But with the free vehicles, which are really just uh, remote vehicles that go down on their own, all you have on board is the, uh, the buoyancy you have, which might only be you know, on the order of 40 or 50 pounds. And so we had to become a little more clever about how to get our, our vehicle back. And is this still a system that's used today? Do you still use it today? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we just use it on the Philippine Sea. It's been used down in Fiji. It's really uh, the best way to go, I think. It's still uh, something of a, uh, it's something of the holy grail for us to really get this working perfectly every time. But once we do that, we have microbial scientists working here on, on new medicines from the sea, uh, both antibiotics and actually cancer cure drugs, and they really need to harvest the sediments to find those, those animals. And so... Um, they're very good at that. I'm very good at this. Together we can do things that really help mankind. So what are some of the most exciting, sort of innovative technologies that you've been involved in, in terms of exploring the deep sea and solving problems like pressure? And We've been able to create new glass spheres that allow us to go to full trench depth anywhere in the ocean. And we can do that now from boats as, as small as 50 feet. So we can go uh, 11 kilometers from a, uh, from a boat that's you know, 20 meters long. So it's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. And so I think we're on the very front end of a whole brand new uh, quest into the very deep sea. And there's other crossover technologies, iridium phones, for example. When your vehicle comes back to the surface, it can call you and let you know it's home. <laughs> so you can go over and pick it up, and it'll tell you where it is with the GPS location as well. And these glass spheres, like, like the huge one in that yellow casing that we saw in the lab, I guess using glass that's air-filled is a lot more environmentally friendly than using some sort of gasoline-type fuel. Oh, yeah. 
you read about the stories of Trieste where they're going down and adjusting their ballast, and they actually vented off gasoline into the environment to make themselves a little heavier, and they drop iron shot to make themselves a little more buoyant. I guess it was fine in the 50s when we were exploring. They didn't have many ideas on, on how or many options for buoyancy, but we have many choices today. And um, all those things that they did in the beginning really brought us to where we are today. Syntactic foam, for example, came directly out of the Trieste program. So uh, we have choices today with titanium spheres, glass spheres, and um, the glass is wonderful because you can just look right through to the inside. So we pull a partial vacuum, and everything on the inside is very dry, and it actually thinks it's at a, an elevation of uh, several thousand feet, and uh, it's a dry, high desert inside the sphere. And we can look in. I have a pocket altimeter on the inside that tells me that the vacuum is still holding, so we know all the, s the seals are working well. Um, glass is invisible to, like, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, so we can communicate to the interior. So there's lots of new bits and pieces that we can apply to our engineering. So it's a really wonderful material to work with. Looking at something like being able to use a much smaller boat means that it's not such an enormous, expensive undertaking to then go out to the deep sea, or is it still pretty expensive? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, Trieste, to make a dive, took three days. Took a day to fill it full of avgas, you know, the big uh, chamber up on top is full of aviation gasoline for flotation. So they took a whole day to load it, then they did a day to do the dive, and then a day to offload the avgas. Well, now we can actually go out there and pretty much get on station and toss it in within 10 minutes of being on station, and then it does its own thing. And we can leave the station if we have an acoustic link. If a storm comes up, we can get out there between, uh, you know, in a weather window, deploy our instrument, and get out of there before the next storm hits. So we can use a smaller boat of operation. Uh, the vehicles are lighter, the air weight's less, so the frame requirements is less. So it's, it's a pretty exciting time to be involved in this now. I think there's a lot of things coming together that are going to allow us to uh, do some things that are going to be remarkable. Stereo, high-def cameras, low-light uh, cameras, red LEDs to allow us to image fish that can't see red. So there's going to be some very interesting things that are going to happen here in the next few years. I would, I would just add as well that it's great that with the new technologies, these free vehicles can be used in a more versatile manner, and we can use boats of opportunity. But to be in a large UNOL ship is a great advantage, because once those samples come up, then you've got a lot of work to do. And so to do all the chemistry and biology that, that you need to do, it's good to have a big ship. So I still, I still like the big ships. Um, but the smaller boats can be used to recover samples quickly and in some cases get them back to a, a laboratory to process them further. I think the smaller boats also give you the opportunity to uh, try different sites. So if something happens in Indonesia and you need to get a boat out of Jakarta, you don't have to wait for a big UNOLS class vessel to come around. So we can get out there right away and maybe do some initial explore, exploration. Uh, but absolutely right, having a larger ship allows you, the, affords you the opportunity to bring many more vehicles along and scatter them about and really cover a very large area. And we're talking about all these un, untethered, unmanned vehicles, but have either of you ever been down inside something like the Alvin submersible, where I guess you kind of, you're packed into those tiny little room. Have either of you ever been down in one of those? I have. I've been down on a few dives in the Alvin, and it's a wonderful experience looking out that porthole. And in my case, we were looking at cold seeps off the northwest coast of, of the United States. Beautiful trip. Um, it's cramped in there, as you indicated, that, you know, three people crammed in in an uncomfortable position, everybody trying to look out a porthole window. And there are real advantages to being right there when it comes to sampling and thinking about the science that you're going to do. Um, and so it's you know, the Alvin provides a, a great deal of, of science to the community, as does the um, the collection of manned submersibles that are used in Japan and France and uh, uh, now in China as well. So that's certainly a powerful complement to what can be done with free vehicles. And I've been down in uh, a couple of smaller submarines, not the Alvin, and it's quite an experience, the first-hand observation. Roger Revelle, our former uh, director, uh, one said that instruments will only see what you tell them to look for. So if you're measuring temperature, that's what you get. So so uh, having the human eye behind uh, the portholes is really, really pretty nice. Uh, the great thing about uh, free vehicles, unmanned vehicles, is uh, their persistence. They can stay down there quite a long time, two years perhaps. You know, If you want to let them study you know, the entire annual cycle of the deep ocean, you can do that. Uh, whereas uh, manned vehicles, their great advantage is the human eye and their mobility. 
Uh, we're picking up some more uh, mobility with AUVs, which are good for like a first order solution to survey a large area. Um, but I think still that there's quite a bit of opportunity for man observation down deep. You definitely see them as a, a complementary pairing of manned and unmanned, not a kind of in the future you think we'll still see both types? Yeah, agreed. You definitely think so? It's going to be a combination. I mean, I guess because you're developing technologies to do with sending these instruments down there, from a personal design point of view, do you feel that the sort of things that you end up working on are going to be for manned vehicles or unmanned vehicles? Well, I think there, there are crossovers, like a Venn diagram where they apply to both. Uh, certain things work better in a manned vehicle, other things I think work better for unmanned vehicles. But I think my, de my head is definitely underwater. And I think, you know, once you've been there and, and you live in that 3D world, uh, it becomes easier to be an engineer to design for that. So I, I saw this once recently in a dive I made in Loreto, Mexico. And uh, we came on this giant boulder, big as a house. And uh, I was kind of following behind this group, and half the group went left around the house to the left, the boulder around to the left. And the other half went around to the right, just like you would in a terrestrial situation with a 2D thinking. And I just kicked the flippers and went over the top. And it was just like going from the front yard to the backyard. So I think it's really an exciting place to be. It's a whole other planet. It's a whole other Earth. Things happen there that don't happen. Topside, spreading centers, subduction zones, all sorts of weird and strange animals, many of which we've yet to find. Every time we go down with a camera, we find something brand new. With samplers, we find something brand new. It's still a remarkable place to go. That was Kevin Hardy and before him Professor Douglas Bartlett from Scripps Institution of Oceanography giving me the lowdown on deep down ocean research. And if you'd like to find out more about exploring the deep sea, check out the latest Naked Oceans podcast, which this month is all about delving into deep sea exploration. You can listen to that and find loads more information about the underwater realm at thenakedscientist.com forward slash oceans. I'm Sarah Castor-Perry. Thanks for listening.